Today on The Grave Talks, a demonic home haunting. What is the recipe for a demonic home haunting? Quite often the word demon is thrown around when discussing a haunting or ghostly encounter. How often, though, is a haunting related to the dark side of the paranormal? When Jacinda Rarick begins her recovery from a back injury, the ghostly forces that she had noticed around her home take a turn for the dark. They quickly make it evident that they do not come in peace. They mean harm. Strange noises quickly escalate to physical and mental attacks on her and her family, forcing her to seek help from the paranormal investigator and demonologist Kevin Trusavich. Kevin and his wife, who's a psychic, quickly identify the entities that make up this demonic home haunting and devise a plan to remove them. But do they succeed? The uh, Rerichs, they lived in a house which um, they did have some activity going on, which was, you know, most houses are haunted. People just don't realize it. And it just takes something and just something environmental, some changes, and uh, it'll kick them out of dormancy. And um, people don't realize that, that some, most houses are haunted. And they were having traditional haunting activity. But what happened to her was uh, she had some back surgery done. And what what happened was that this thing was waiting for, it was their d- dormant, the demonic entity. But it was waiting for something to feed on. And it was her injury and her psychological um, weakness due to the surgery. So it came in on her. Prior to having surgery and and being in a state of vulnerability, what was going uh, on? Was there any signs for her that there was something going on with the house? She was using um, just basically orbs and sounds, mm-hmm. the normal kind of, well, we would say normal. Sure. Things that, you know. Uh, but what one big mistake she did when when she thought there was something wrong, and this happens a lot now, is they brought in a group that were weren't as knowledgeable they were new uh they thought they knew everything from watching tv which is a big mistake Mm -hmm. and what they did they cranked it up and they left her that way so a group came in to to see what they could do to help because she didn't know who to contact and, and a lot of folks are eager to jump into a situation when they get the call uh, especially if they mm-hmm. are new. So what what went on there when that first group came in that it stirred it up and not for the better? Well, what happens when you run into a group? Uh, the, the, the demonic entities are very intelligent, very smart. And uh, it showed itself or played as though it was a, uh, a normal traditional haunting. And what they showed on their evidence was that it was just traditional haunting. Mm-hmm. And that's their ploy, because the longer they stay in the house, the longer they could deceive people, the stronger they get. So when you have uh, when you have some light things oh, go going on, like, like she had with, with orbs uh, in pictures, mm-hmm. or when she was just kind of feeling things here and there... Uh, in this specific case, do you believe that that itself right there was the demonic trying to essentially mask itself as something ghost light, if you will, um, and, and not what it was to essentially be kind of blown off? And, oh, it, it's no big deal, so it can kind of step by step uh, build uh-huh. itself up. Yeah, it's uh, well, what happened was um, I, le- I listened for key phrases when I talked to them. When she contacted me by phone, I'm I am very in-depth with questions. Mm-hmm. And I have some that steer toward demonic and some toward traditional. Okay? You know how um, George Carlin had seven dirty words sure. that he would listen for? I have 32 questions that I ask. And then that helps me round off what it is. And as I was going through the list, these things were pointing to more demonic than they were traditional haunting. Like the activity only occurred at certain times of the day, the activity. Mm-hmm. It would happen in sequences. Um, there were uh, odors, which were not pleasant odors, because sometimes in a traditional haunting, you get the smell of roses, flowers, c- cigars, 
this was more of a sulfur smell and it only occurred in the it was strongest from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So that's a sign of a, uh, a demonic entity. Why is it that that there's only certain hours or certain areas that that lean you more towards it being something demonic uh, versus uh, a, a, a someone who had once walked the earth, if you will? Well, the demonic have they 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 hate natural light. Mm-hmm. So any when it starts getting 6 p.m., it starts getting darker, then they can, they can come out. They're stronger at that time. Uh, human entities don't have that fear. People just don't notice them during the day because the house is always active. Mm-hmm. But demonic entities have a, a hatred of natural light. So their activity usually occurs from 6 p.m., and the high noon for them is 3 a.m., and then it'll go on till 6 a.m. But they'll be most active at 3 a.m. When she was having these things go on, uh, even before she contacted you, was she alone in, in her belief that something was going on, or, or did her family support her in, in, in this uh, feeling that there was something going on with the house? This was a classic case of the demonic, how they feed on one person. They were feeding on her and doing things to her. And what they do is try to break down the family dynamics by people, nothing happening to them, to the other people in the house. They start thinking, they start thinking she's crazy when she's seeing these things, or, and they start questioning her. So they're breaking down the family psychologically. Usually, uh, traditional hauntings, everybody gets some kind of activity. But in a demonic, they pick on one person. It's usually the housewife just because she's there most of the time by herself. What were they doing specifically to break down the dynamics and the relationship in this case? Well, what they would do is uh, they would make noises for her. They rearranged her medications. She'd put them out, she'd turn around, and they'd be moved. Uh, she was a painter, and she would find her paintings vandalized. Um, she would see her husband sleeping, and what happened, she would wake up and she saw him once look like a corpse laying in bed with her and she couldn't wake him up which is a sign of a it, which is called a psychic sleep she was screaming but no one else could hear her and they had, the other people go into a psychic sleep but they such a deep sleep that they don't hear her yeah screaming it was a it was a traditional textbook demonic entity by its activity so by the time that that she had contacted the other group that ended up stirring things up. What sort of a time window was there between that investigation, uh, in quotes, to bringing other folks in who had more education on what to be doing with a situation like this? It, it was approximately six months. Okay, so she sat there and, and it was stirred up. And, and it, mm-hmm. what was she? What was going through her mind at, in that six month period after having one group come in, and what what drove her to finally contact someone else to try and and get this resolved or get a grip on what was happening with her home and her family? Well, the thing is, she was getting more personal uh, attacks. And then what finally put it over the edge was her son had an injury and he was homebound and things were happening to him because he was psychologically broken down too, just because of his injury, because mm-hmm. he couldn't do anything. He was 18 years old and you feel like you're, uh, you're at that age, you feel like your life's falling apart. Mm-hmm. But you can't do anything. So they were feeding on that. And after she had got a second witness, then they knew there was something wrong. So we were only about 20 miles away from them, and she called us out of the blue to help her. And let's talk about that a little bit. I know you touched on it earlier about asking questions. When when you have someone calling you, um, and I'm sure you probably yeah. you know get several calls, and, and several are legitimate, several are you know broken down, and you probably discover maybe there isn't much here. What was mm-hmm. what was your first impression, and and can you walk us through? in detail some of those questions you asked and the answers that she gave you okay well first of all i usually ask them how long they lived in the house and uh, when did they start noticing activity and they just start noticing activity 
when they did a little renovation in a house. And I, that's a normal thing. If it's a traditional haunting, they're a creature of habit. If there's any kind of change in the atmosphere in the house, uh, any renovation, even a change in the house, as in bringing a cat or a new baby in the house, that'll crank it up. Well, she had some of that going on, which I thought, okay, traditional haunting right away. But then she started, when I asked her about the time, she said it's, it's quiet during the day, but at night it's more active. That's when the bells went off in my head. And then I did ask her about smells, odors, anything like that. She did say there was a sulfuric odor in the house. And um, was there any kind of physical attacks or anything like that? And she said she just felt like she was being held down. And usually she did. And usually human, human entities will not do that to a person. And it's those kind of questions. You have to be really in depth to, to find out if somebody's exaggerating or is it truly happening so she answered most of the questions I mean she, out of 32 about 18 are steered toward dem demonic and she answered 17 of them so sure <laughs> correctly when, when you have this I mean did it strike you what's your compass on this when someone calls you and has a, a story and has a, a, an issue and they're wanting help uh, is it just the answers to the questions how do you determine that th there's something going on here um, it, it, what's your what's your spidey sense if you will to know yes this okay. is legitimate versus this is not legitimate well, what I do is I do the questions first just to find out what I might be dealing with. Mm -hmm. Then second of all, I set up a, a time for an interview where I take my wife and I go together. First, I take my wife because I always like to have a witness with me in case I happen to see something or something occurs. Mm -hmm. Secondly, my wife, she is a psychic. She is very good. She, I, I, we actually met over ghost hunting 20 years ago and she is very very sensitive on these things and when she walks in she'll tell me well there's nothing really here or there's something here that's it's traditional not to be scared of when we walked into her house she said there's something here and it's bad because as we walked in the house and we sat down she had this panic look in her eye and I knew her right away. And I said, Christine, what's the problem? I whispered to her that question to her. She said, there's a child here and he's in the hallway, but he doesn't look like a child. He looks more like a devil and he's screaming at me. And usually they do that because they know the psychic can unmask them. The psychic knows that they're not, they're pulling some kind of ploy. So the psychic is the worst enemy. So they tried scaring her out. So, you, so I just don't go by questions. I go by interviews, too. I'll go and do a personal interview. Sure. So when, when you went there and, and you had the personal interview and you determined, okay, there's something going on here. We need to to look into this deeper. Uh -huh. What was the first step? What do you do once you determine there's something going on here? And, and what is the goal uh, as, as you're called into something like this? Okay. Okay. Uh, what I do is then I, I set up an I call investigation intervention. I don't call it a cleansing. I call it an intervention because we're intervening on the intervening on behalf of the family. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I set up the early state I could, which was actually the following week. And I got my team together. My team consists of approximately thirty people, but I, I have eight that are trained to do demonic infestations, and they know it's a volunteer group. They know there's some repercussions that could happen from the entity itself, and they're all well aware of it. And that's who I t took on this case. And what we do is we try to make the house, we don't do what's called, what would you say, an exorcism. We try to make the area unpleasant for it. We try to make it that, that it just doesn't want to stay there. We drive it out of the house. So there's no real way of destroying a, a demonic entity like they have on TV. What you're doing, you're relocating them. You're chasing them from the area. So we make the area so uncomfortable, they have to leave. And, and what do you do, like specifically, how do you go through that process? Well, I was, through my years, I did an apprenticeship of demonology with an Anglican nun, one with a Byzantine monk. 
And I'm visiting Catholic, so I kind of stay with that because I'm, I'm more familiar with that. What we do is do prayers, and we also play chants, Gregorian chants, or a chants that the, uh, the Byzantine monks would play. And as we do that, we make the place uncomfortable. And then I go from room to room, blessing each room, and, and cleansing the room, sealing the room, every doorway, every window. And then we just drive it toward the main entrance, and as it goes out the main entrance, we seal that door so it can't come back in again. When you went through the intervention process, as you called it, did anything mm-hmm. occur? What were what were your feelings as you were going through that process in that home? Mm-hmm. Um, when I do the intervention process, I'm usually so deep in thought. I have a safety person that goes with me, and his name is James. I trust him very well. He's a uh, very... Um, uh, it takes a lot to, to frazzle him. You have to hit him with a brick to frazzle him. But as we were going through the process, I acquired a very bad headache that I almost went blind. It was hurt that bad, like a migraine. And I knew that it was trying to fight, fight me by doing that. It was trying to take my attention away from it. And he also had a headache at the same time. So we knew we were targets. But I kept pushing on with it. And as it, we progressed and progressed, and we knew it was done. What was really amazing, and this happens maybe 40, 40% of the time you do an intervention, there was a smell of roses in the house. That means you had divine intervention. Because what most of the prayers are aimed toward the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary is the demonic's worst enemy. And that was just fascinating when that happened. Because the first thing I did when I smelled that, I thought, Okay, do they have air fresheners? I'm looking around. My James looked around. The other investigators looked around. There's no air fresheners, no candles, but there's a heavy scent of roses in the house. Uh, take me back a little bit further with your own experiences, and then we'll we'll, we'll rejoin this case specifically. I'd love to learn more about uh, you know how you decided to get involved with cases like this having talked to hundreds of people over the years on this topic many don't want to touch or 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 stay very arm's length away from cases that involve demonic entities um it's it sounds like you're fairly involved with them what what made you decide to 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 tackle that uh more readily i guess than others well um it all happened, I'd say, 10 years into my investigating experience. I received a phone call out of the blue from this Anglican nun. And at first I thought it was a crank call because I didn't know this person from Adam. Mm-hmm. And she called me and asked me uh, if I'm interested in doing demonic because she heard about the cases we do, the hauntings, and she said, you seem like a very trustworthy person. And the reason she contacted me is you just cannot be a demonologist just because you think it's cool. You're chosen by someone. They choose to pass the torch to somebody. And I was chosen. I thought, okay, this, you know, I'm kind of interested because you really are helping people. Even with investigating haunting, you're helping people. But this, you're really doing something that's helping people. You're getting the, you're making the, the, the family more comfortable, psychologically sound. You're helping them a lot more than you would just on a ghost investigation. And she contacted me, and first of all, you just start doing little things. You just help them out. You be their assistant. Then they start watching you. You run the whole show. And then after that, you're on your own. And a lot of people will not touch these cases because there are repercussions to it. Um, The demonic entity will see, like I said, the psychic as the enemy, but also the demonologist is the enemy. So many things will happen in your household before a case like this. Uh, I've had cases where, before we went out, my wife and I would be in the house, and the lights would start to flicker. And we thought, okay, it's electrical, but then we see the switches going up and down. Or we would get the, uh, the odor in the house. It's warning us not to come. Mm-hmm. So, and also, that if you're not also the target, but anything you love is the target, uh, your family, your friends, anything, it'll get to you somehow. So you have to really be aware that this is a 
you're stuck in this for life, basically. What are some of the things that you do essentially to to put on the seatbelt when going into a, a demonic case to prevent or lessen the chances of of something happening to yourself, uh, a repercussion of some uh, some sort, uh, you know, or, or those that you care about? Well, what I usually do is I do the prayer to St. Michael prior to that, and then I also have a prayer that protects the homeowners, the clients, as we call them, and also the team members. So we're actually, uh, we're calling on divine intervention on that to protect us when we go in. Has there ever been a a situation where prayer said you go through the case and whatever it is still lingers, still goes beyond uh, the protection that that you had, had put out for yourself? Not as of yet. I I won't say no, but not as of yet. We've been fair for my team members and clients have been fairly safe so far. We just talked about some of the dangers involved with a a demonologist and a psychic stepping into a situation, into a case to to try and help. What are some of the dangers involved to a homeowner or the individual that's that's calling on, on someone to come in and help? Should, you know, said investigation or intervention or cleansing, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, not not succeed that that first attempt or even after several? What what, what could they possibly face uh, with something like this being stirred up? Oh, there's there's possibilities of more physical attacks, uh, men, uh, mental issues, psychological attacks. There's also been sexual assaults by these things. Um. What I try to do is when the place we know, there's a, there's a feeling over the house when it's out. It gets, you almost, I, I'm not psychic at all. I'm as psychic as a rock, okay? But when the thing is done, the house feels lighter. But what we try to do is try to make the environment less hospitable for it. So what we'll do is tell them, let in more natural light, get rid of dark curtains, open the shades during the day. Uh, try to play happy music. Try to change the the, the family attitude. Uh, have more parties, things like that. Make the hap- make the house more pleasant, and that'll drive them out. So that helps. That that helps if there's any residual around or tries to get back in. It's preventative. If it's not a habitable place for something dark, it's less likely that it's going to continue to want to reside yes, there. Yes, you have to make it very uncomfortable. Yes. Is it. is it possible when someone is going through something like this to drive out the entity on their own simply by changing the environment up in a dramatic sense, psychologically, through their feelings, their actions, and how they, they handle themselves and the environment? Or does it always require some sort of a third-party intervention to come in and, and fully drive it out? I would say it's more third-party intervention because you can do... You can change the environment, but you have to know what you're dealing with first mm-hmm. before you walk. There's uh, there's a hierarchy of entities and of the demonic entity, and this was a mid level. And sometimes the, there's mid level. Well, first of all, the lowest strength is a brute. The mid level is more of the ones that um, know all your actions and it studies you and knows all your 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 fears, and then there's the diabolical. This was mid-level. A brute will react to the change in atmosphere. That'll chase it out. But if you do all these other things, it's not going to affect a mid-level or a diabolical because they're savvy. They're smart. It won't affect them at all. And you could more likely make it mad by doing that. So you're better off because somebody coming in that knows what to look for, uh, knows exactly how to deal with and what level they're dealing with. How do you determine what type of entity and level of entity you're dealing with and how quickly can you determine that? Oh, it's well, some the brutes are the like I said, it was the lower level and they're very, very animalistic. Uh, they show themselves very quickly. Um, they'll, uh, do things that are uh, showy, okay? Uh, they'll slam doors. They'll make footsteps. 
they'll give up the sulfuric smell. Uh, they're very, very, very easy to detect. Mid-level is harder to find. That's why I have to use my sensitive. I actually have two, I call my stable, two sensitives. And one, her name is Liz. She can tell me right away what level it is just by the activity. And Josette, well, Christine, that's her alias. She uses when she goes out. Um, she could also tell me what level I'm dealing with. So I use them more in my coon dogs to tell okay. me what I'm dealing with. I'm assuming... And I'll, I'll adjust my intervention toward that, what it is. I was just going to say, I'm assuming based on the level of what's there and what you're dealing with, I would, uh, I'm sure, affect exactly how you handled the case. Um, you said yeah. this, this was a mid-level one. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, the, the stronger the level, the higher the level it is, does that, how does that then associate with, with what you have to do to essentially drive it out? Does it require more interventions? Does it require oh, yeah. a different type of intervention? Yeah. How, does that, uh, how does that correlate? The stronger it is, the harder it is to get out. We've been at places where we have to do the intervention, which the prayer is the process. We'd have to do it three or four times. It would get weaker and weaker, but it wasn't driven out till like the fourth, or third, or fourth time. It's just repetition. Okay. When you go to basically drive something out and as you said earlier it, it it's not that it, it destroys it or, or makes it disappear it essentially relocates it how how does sure. how, where exactly you know and, and this is obviously relative but when, when something is driven out of a home when, when you think of the living uh if they're driven out of a home they tend to not usually go all that far from the physical location where they were at when something like this is driven out of a home are there restrictions on it, so to speak, as to how far it travels? Is it completely up to the entity? Does it stay in the neighborhood? <laughs> where, where typically, it, where can it, it go? It'll move on to anybody in that area okay. that will have some kind of issue, and the issue includes alcoholism. It includes um, suicidal thoughts. It includes some kind of psychological imbalance. It, it's a predator. Okay. So once we seal the house, it'll move on to somebody in that area. So it does stay geographically somewhat close. Have you ever somewhat. Have you ever been in a situation where you've driven something out of a home, away from a specific family, and then shortly thereafter you get a call from someone within the same area that says, we got oh, something yes, going on, and, and you recognize yes. that's the same thing I just dealt with? Yeah. Yeah, because as soon as we walk in, the two psychics at my stable say, we we, we faced them before. Mm -hmm. They know right away. And we know how to deal with them. And there's also ways we do, too, is that um, they have a sign. They, they usually have some kind of um, uh, ways of showing that it's a demonic by just the, the environment. When I go to a house and we do an initial interview, I'll look around. And if it's across we had one case that was across the street from a church and they usually like churches across because it's showing that it doesn't care about the church mm -hmm. uh also it's the time of the year it's usually some kind of religious holiday they're more active because they're showing that i don't care it's a religious holiday so more activity occurs around them so there's many things to look out for do the demonic entities uh, have let, let's say we're, we're talking about you basically revisiting one uh, as it moved on to another another family another another situation is it starting from square one with that new individual that you're going to help does it have the same strength as it had before or is it weakened or injured from the past intervention it's not weakened at all it starts at square one again it'll start uh, manipulating the person uh, uh, that it's targeting alone to, ma to make them seem like they're psychologically unsound. It starts all the process all over again. It's not weakened at all. We just basically made it. Uh, it's no trespassing area in that last house. So it still has the same strength. We just made it unpleasant for it. It's not weaker at all. So it comes uh, right back at full strength in a, a new oh, setting, yeah. essentially. Yeah. 
Yep. Is there ever a way to completely cast something like that out or destroy it, or is this just the cycle of how no. they work? No, they're they're indestructible, okay. and they have the intelligence of the ages. That's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with something that's very very smart. Um, what I like to say when I do a ghost investigation with just a normal. Uh, t- traditional human entity mm-hmm. I try to outthink them like where would I go if I was trying to hide from these people but the demonic you can't because you don't know what it's doing it, it knows what we're doing before we get there it knows that we're coming it knows everything so you really can't destroy it or you don't know what it's going to do That wraps up part one of our interview with Kevin there's much more to come though in part two when we talk with Kevin about demonic entities And when they're relocated, where do they go? Did the family fully understand what was going on and what did they initially think was haunting them? What's more difficult to deal with, the human spirit or demonic spirit? What occurred when the first intervention happened at the Rurik home? What did Kevin learn about the history of the property? And when you say most houses are haunted, what exactly did Kevin mean by this? And are there more demonic infestations than we tend to understand? Until next time, for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.